Hello, everyone, and welcome to Traffic Corner Tuesday. My name is Nancy Crow, and I'm the Vice President of Marketing for SPAC Consulting. I'll be your host for today's session. Uh, originally, we had planned for this to be on our uh, old platform, which is GoToMeeting. So thank you for everybody who uh, did the extra step of signing up to use our demo system today. Just to get things kicked off here, I want to remind everybody to please mute your mics so we don't catch any of the background uh, noise going on in your office. And also, please join the conversation today. There is a chat box on your screen, so feel free to ask any questions throughout the course of the meeting, and our presenters will be happy to answer that for you. Today's session is brought to you by SPAC Consulting, which is part of the SPAC Enterprise family of companies. The SPAC Enterprise it consists of a group of six traffic engineering related companies that provide a wide range of services including traffic study consulting, traffic data collection, and of course traffic uh, data products. Excuse me. <clears throat> you can learn more about any of our companies by visiting the Mike on Traffic blog. Today's session is numbers every traffic engineer should know, but we already have posted our next two sessions for the year. We have Right Turn on Red Research Study that will be presented in February. There will be a link at the end of this session so that you can register for that session uh, in February right after we are done. Um, and in March, we will be talking about alternative intersections. Finally, as a thank you for joining us today, we do have a special guide that we are offering all of our attendees. It's nine numbers every traffic engineer should know. Stick around to the end of our session and we will tell you how you can get your free copy uh, sent directly to you. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Mike Spack is the president of Spack Consulting and he is the recognized authority on traffic studies. He is a graduate of the University of Minnesota past president of the North Central Section of the Institute of Transportation Engineers, and he is a fellow of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. Since 1996, Mike has led over a thousand traffic engineering projects. During the past two decades, Mike has founded four companies, including SPAC Consulting, and he is the creative force and principal writer of the industry-leading blog, Mike on Traffic. He's also an accomplished author who has several articles written in a variety of industry publications, and he has his own industry manuals that are used by engineers throughout the world. Also joining us today is Bryant Fiesek. Bryant is the vice president of SPAC Consulting and is widely known in the transportation industry, having managed more than 700 traffic engineering projects. He is also a graduate of the University of Minnesota and he is an expert in the Synchro, Sim Traffic, Vistro, and vSim Traffic Modeling Software. Bryant thrives on developing creative solutions to traffic and transportation issues, and he is a regular contributor on Mike on Traffic blog. He also has numerous industry publication articles in numerous industry publications and is the co-author of several industry manuals. Please welcome me in joining both Bryant and Mike to today's session. Thanks, Nancy. So Mike here and Bryant, uh, hang on a second. Okay, <laughs> bear with us. Thanks for uh, coming along. We're switched over to our Demio platform, which uh, has some nice features for us and also allows us to reach out to a much bigger audience uh, than go to meeting. Would have cost us thousands of dollars to upgrade uh, to be able to accommodate our audience past 100 attendees. And everybody should have sound and audio now, so I think that was my fault. I didn't click a button right away, so apologize, but I, I think we got everything working now. Okay, so let's get into today's presentation. We have a bunch of stuff to get through, so uh, several engineers probably will call us out on this. Really, we're going to cover nine topics and give you lots of numbers around those topics, uh, but we're going to kind of go through these are areas when we're in a meeting with clients or we're in front of a public hearing these are kind of themes for the questions we get asked and so we've gone mm -hmm. the step of putting together a kind of a cheat sheet that we carry in our portfolios when we go to meetings so we can look them up and over time we've memorized a lot of these numbers uh because you do look a little sharper yeah. <laughs> a little sharper if you can just roll off that hey a subdivision with a hundred Houses is going to have a thousand trips a day and about a hundred in the peak hour. If you if 
you get those kinds of questions yep. and you can roll off the number. Makes it look good. Makes it look like that expert. Um, so there are rules of thumb, though, that uh, we'll go through the different sources for the material, but we do a lot of rounding so we can do the math on the spot. So that leads right into our first one, trip generation. And we've got kind of the top five land uses that you would expect to be asked about. So single family homes, apartments, office, retail, and industrial. So these are the daily trip generation and peak hour trip generation for these developments. Again, as Mike said, it's rounded to make it easier. So if someone asks, what's a 5,000 office about to generate or what do you think that'll generate? You can easily come back and yeah. say about 50 trips. And these are rounded numbers out of the ITE trip mm -hmm. generation manual, the 10th edition. Um, and one thing I've talked about in past webinars is I learned a trick in a fabulous book everyone should read called The Psychology of Influence by Robert Cialdini. Um, but he talked about when people do simple math in their head, it de-escalates their emotions. Um, so I like to, when I'm going in front of a public hearing and kind of talking in front of a hostile crowd, as I'm sure I'm the only one who has to do, um, <laughs> but traffic off, often seems like a scapegoat for trying to kill a project that people just don't want in their backyard. So I will try to do a simple math exercise at the beginning of my presentation to try to especially snap the city council members back into a more rational mindset. Mm -hmm. All right, moving on, we're going to go to our second topic, road capacity. Yeah, and these are planning level capacity numbers based on the latest highway capacity manual, the sixth edition. And there's a lot of assumptions baked into the tables there. So again, these are rules of thumb. Um, and we pick the daily capacity at kind of the level of service DE boundary. Um, and there is a range there of vehicles, but we'll just kind of go through the first ones. And the first bullet point, and this is a controversial one because this is the one number that's not out of the highway capacity manual. It's the two lane local road. Um, our next bullet point is gonna show somewhere a two lane road has a capacity of more than 10,000 vehicles per day. But of course, you don't want to tell somebody in their subdivision out in the suburbs that, hey, your road can handle 10,000 cars a day. They mm -hmm. will look at you like you're insane. And early in my career, I came across, I read about research coming out of the University of California, Berkeley. I believe the research was done in the 70s that when a local street had more than 1,000 cars per day, they measured that people didn't know as many of their neighbors and they were able to kind of subjectively measure that quality of life degraded. So this research put kind of the line at a thousand vehicles per day on just a local two lane road of, for livability purposes, kind of what's the ADT threshold. So that's what I've used throughout my career. If any of you have other resources or can help me find that research, because I've never <laughs> been able to, I've gone to back to my University of Minnesota library, I've emailed people at Berkeley, I've done all kinds of things. I think it was Professor Dwani, something related to uh, those new urbanist folks that I got on this thread, but I can't find that resource, um, but I still use it. Luckily, uh, we haven't been <clears throat> Excuse me. We haven't been challenged too much on it. Um, but I will say there are, um, for all of these, you need to confirm with your local agency because there are variations that people will, will present. There are some cities we work in where they use 3,000 for that level or 2,500, somewhere in that range. So I, I think it's safe to say that there is a lower number that is not based on capacity but is based on that livability. And so it's it's very much be aware of the of that lower number. And and when you're thinking about it, remember it's it's not just the physical ability of the road to handle the cars, it's also what is on the road, yeah. what's adjacent to it. Some cities will go, especially when you're talking about collectors that are supposed to operate just locally within a neighborhood. And those roads often look just like the roads a block over that are not collector roads that they'll put a threshold of a couple thousand vehicles per day on those type of what we would call a minor collector, um, even though their capacity is significantly more, but they they wanna keep, 
if they're working on the system, they want to balance it out that way. Right. Uh, just a couple quick comments we had in the uh, column there. It is a thousand, not 10,000. We didn't make an error in the number there. So again, yeah, that's a livability, not necessarily capacity. Yep. Because yeah. the physical <clears throat> capacity <throat> is 10,000 vehicles <throat> or even a little bit more. Um, correct. So mm -hmm. yeah, the traffic engineering classes are correct. And then the second question is that in terms of passenger cars per day or just physical number of vehicles? And we go off of average daily traffic numbers. So you're, you're looking at just vehicles. You're not looking at passenger car equivalents. Um, but, but again, these are rules of thumb. And if you're getting yes, down to the, yes. if you're getting down to the definition between PCU and vehicles, you're really kind of, I think too close to the razor's edge <laughs> that these are just broad category numbers. All right, moving on to a four lane road with turn lanes. We're up to 36, so roughly double the two lane. So again, if you wanted to round those numbers, go to 18,000, 36,000. That's an easy way to remember it as well. You don't have to worry about it as a, as a planning. This is just, again, that ability to handle the vehicles. And then for the six lane, you're up to 55, again, roughly yeah. 18 per two lanes. So, so I like what Brian just said. Just think of each two lanes as 18,000 vehicles. So 18,036.54 mm -hmm. is just gets you in the ballpark. Um, and there is based on the split, the commuter split, directional, all kinds of different factors that go into those numbers. So that would be a reasonable estimate. All right. A couple other quick questions. Uh, yes, we are recording. This will be available after the fact. And are more to the topic right now, are there hard medians with the turn lanes? I would say when you get to the four and six lane, there could be with the two lane, it could be a three lane road as opposed to those definitions. So the median, yep. that's one of those specific factors. Yes, that, and you can uh, dig into the highway. Into the, yeah, you can dig into the highway capacity manual and get more refined. But just we're not asking you to put these numbers into your report and make any decisions on them. These are just kind of ballpark of in the range of <laughs> correct, <laughs> correct. All right, next one: level of service grades. So what we like to really identify is the DDE boundary. So. E is typically your at capacity. Most agencies will say that's unacceptable. They want to stay at level of service D or better. And so that is the boundary that we look at. So three different types of traffic control when we're looking at intersections, stop signs, roundabouts, traffic signals, the stop sign control and roundabouts, they use the same uh, same metric. In this case, it's 35 seconds of average delay for the intersection. When you go to a traffic signal, people have uh, a greater capacity for waiting at a signal. They know they're going to get their green so they can sit longer. And that's why we have 55 seconds for the traffic signal. This information is uh, from the Highway Capacity Manual, 6th edition. It hasn't changed through many My editions. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it's always been the same for me. Um, but if someone is trying to relay that level of service grade to delay, or you're trying to make that definition back and forth, it's important to know that those are the values that you're looking at. Yeah. And again, they are average delays. So that is a nuance to talk to people that that means some people get to go through at a roundabout or a signal with a uh, zero to a couple of seconds delay, but people on a busy cross street waiting to get mm -hmm. in, they can wait a minute and a half. Again, it's the average. Um, and then we're not gonna talk about side street where the highway capacity manual doesn't <laughs> talk yeah. about overall mm -hmm. level of service and only does the side street. And uh, again, there's variations in there, but the, the important for all of these, these are just basic numbers to keep in mind, so as you're talking to people, uh, particularly if you're presenting at a city council meeting, yeah. public presentation, <laughs> you have that information either at your hand or in the back of your head to quickly respond to people right but, then and there. 
but kind of a warning based on a dumb mistake I made early in my career. I did a traffic study down in Rochester, Minnesota. I used the level of service DE boundary as acceptable, unacceptable. I turned in the whole traffic study on Thursday, I think, and next week was the city council meeting. And I got a quick note back from the city engineer saying, our, didn't you look at our city code? Our level of service C is acceptable and level of service D is not. So I was off <laughs> on the gradation right. scale of what they considered acceptable. And I worked that weekend hustling to get that study redone uh, for my client so it wouldn't impact mm -hmm. their delivery going in front of the city council. But always check <laughs> the local right. resources, check in with the local city engineer. Good rule of thumb here, but don't put your foot in the mouth. Yeah. All right, our next one is saturation flow rate. So this is for a specific uh, lane, basically. You have a you have a lane, you have an entry lane, you have a um, you just have a, a your single lane going into uh, development or anything. You can. Uh, you can use this as the backdrop for that. So 1,900 vehicles per hour per lane. So in, in most of most studies, you're not going to have to reference this. It's not going to come up because you're looking at the intersections or corridors, and it, it doesn't get down to that grade of detail. More importantly, where this would come up is if you're doing kind of a, a QA, QC check, uh, particularly for events, and you have an entry that's coming in and you're either reviewing it or your computer is telling you, yeah, you can fit 3000 vehicles on this single lane into this parking lot or something like that. That's where this becomes more important to think back on and say, okay, there's, we have our theoretical maximum of 1900 per hour per lane. If we have one lane and this is telling me 3000 vehicles per hour, how, how does that work? That's, it's, it's not possible. Yeah, just because the computer is giving us an answer. This is just one of those things to quality control check yourself. Uh, keep in the back of your mind. And I usually just round to 2000 is easier to remember. Yeah. But um, yeah, that just kind of quality control check. Yep. And this is from the highway capacity manual again. So next up is kind of quick rule of thumb on when you need a dual to transition from having a single left turn lane to having a dual left turn lane. And the rule of thumb here is 300 vehicles per hour is about that break point where a single lane at a signal starts to break down and you need to look at adding a second left turn lane. Um, also, we've seen it referenced as the threshold for adding a second right turn lane, mm -hmm. but we don't, that's a tougher rule of thumb. If you look at this aerial that, there's the northbound free rights. And depending on how long of the auxiliary lane is provided, I, I think you can get more than 300 vehicles per hour uh, if you provide enough of its own lane. Of course, if it's bang and yield controlled right merging in, that's a different scenario than this, which is a different scenario than having a dedicated lane for a quarter of a mile. Yeah, and similarly, there is a metric that some people use when you go to triple lefts, which is double the dual as you go to 600 vehicles per hour. I haven't seen too much research on it, so use that to give them with a grain of salt, I'd say. But again, starting with your 300 for duals, double that, 600 for triples. Yeah. Uh, again, just basic guidelines for when you should expand that geometry. Yeah, and this probably won't come up in front of a public testimony city council meeting, but this is more of the numbers that you want to have in the back of your mind when you're going in and talking to a developer or architect about the layout or when you're talking in a meeting with the city engineer about expansion plans at an intersection or just looking at your analysis and what again going back to what did the computer say if you're 400 left turns and it's saying you can get through there on a single lane and it's giving you a level of service b yeah <laughs> that might yeah. be something to double check right just to make sure there isn't a glitch in the software you're using and that's 300 vehicles in the left turn lane specifically not we're not looking at the through volumes here it's just a general guideline for the number of left turn movements 
Okay, we need to kind of pick up the pace here for the last 10 minutes. So I think we'll hold questions till the end as we normally do. So the next topic, the sixth topic is driveway widths. And this is more getting back to an internal meeting. And again, caveat emptor that local standards, local conditions vary greatly, but these are reasonable numbers we've seen in lots of different guides. And we believe in that kind of just a single driveway, provide 14, one lane in or out, 14 feet. You can narrow up to 24 if it's a one lane in, one lane out. And then if you have two lanes out and one lane in, you can even, instead of you go to the 40 feet and kind of, of course, industrial areas, you need larger yeah. <laughs> lane widths to accommodate uh, the industrial trucks, the semi trucks, and also larger radii at the driveway. Yeah, and that's an important thing that's not on here too. Obviously, if you have a just a residential two-lane road development, you come up to an intersection, you can get by with a 30, 40 foot radii on the corner, and most vehicles will be able to make that easily. If you have the longer semi trucks, now you're going to need the 50, 60, 70 foot radius uh, to make sure you can get around the corners <laughs> and not, not jump the curb. Yeah, and then they get so big that you model them as having a right turn lane. Right. And yeah, um, a whole nother topic. Yes. All right, access spacing. So uh, this is really looking at your driveways uh, or could be intersections too. So your public, your private roads, how do they intersect on the roads? And big differences here between the type of road that you have. So first one is local. We've got a good area on the background here where you can see residential development in the back. And if you really look hard, you could probably see some individual driveways there. Um, but as you just look at this local setup here, the intersections are closed. There's individual driveways. I mean, that local spacing can be very, very close. Similarly, on this other side over here, um, again, multifamily mostly here, but they've got the connections pretty close together. And then kind of the east-west local road, you can see for that commercial retail area, not worried about mobility very much. You're much more work concerned with access. Mm -hmm. and you can see the closeness of the driveways. Um, so 150 feet is our guide to make sure that there is some stacking room between intersections so you don't end yep. up with safety weaving problems. So for Collector Road, which is kind of similar to this east-west on the bottom of the aerial here, uh, you can see there's a bit more space in between the driveways. Uh, we would say 660 feet for those full access ones. Again, this is getting to more your distance between them for turn lanes, yeah. um, for that sort of information, just or, or the, yeah. for that sort of geometry to make sure you, you've got that proper stacking because you're going to have higher volumes yeah. at those intersections. And you can see where the pointer is that kind of try to make sure those intersections are squared up. So you have four legged intersections where if you go up to the northern collect that local road on the north, you'll see driveways offset, not as big a deal, um, especially if you have a two way left turn lane. But mm -hmm. And then we get to the arterial. So again, this is in the functional classification where you're most concerned about mobility. Access is less of a concern. Two that we usually fall back on are your limited access, your right in, right out at 660 feet, and then your full access at a quarter to a half mile. And kind of this north-south road here would be that arterial, and you can see They've got two signalized intersections, no access in between. That's probably, that's your quarter to a half mile there. So yeah. again, good spacing. Yeah, and this, for any of those international metric type folks on the line, this is very much uh, uh, based on mile spacing. So 2,640 feet, that's half a mile. Then we get down to quarter mile. Then we get down to eighth mile. Um, that's how we were and brought up thinking through our engineer careers uh, in segments of miles. All right, getting close to the end here. Next one is for roundabout and the inscribed circle diameter, outside diameters, what the OD is for there. So through our picture, we're just showing you 
we're looking from edge to edge of that roundabout. So this encompasses the center island uh, and, your, and your circulating lanes. And really what you're looking at are the corners. If you think of a standard development that normally would come to a corner. And so you need to know that diameter of the circle to say how much are you pushing back onto those corner developments. Yeah, and this is a rule of thumb. The different rules of thumb kind of single lane somewhere between 120 and 160 feet, dual lanes 160 to 215 foot diameter. And then kind of the mini roundabouts, kind of the new, which I've blogged about and seem to be working successfully. Mm -hmm. The mini roundabouts where you're really just dropping an island more in a standard intersection, that's 50 to 80 feet um, diameter. So this is again, more of the planning design level meetings. Yeah, if, if you're considering a roundabout, you can easily draw that circle over an aerial and just see what are the impacts. Do you have room? If yeah. you're looking at that sort of range. Are there slopes? Are there retaining walls? Are there trees, utilities? Just kind of drop that circle mm -hmm. on an aerial mm -hmm. so you can start to just in five minutes <laughs> figure out good, bad, ugly. It, yeah. <laughs> is it even feasible or is the water feature too close? Something like yeah. that. All right. And our number nine number or topic for those who are going to hold us to that technicality. Uh, Parking rates. So this is, as you're looking at a development and you're trying to figure out what do you need to provide for that parking lot? What are some general guidelines that we look at? And the three basic ones we have, multifamily, retail, and restaurant. So multifamily, one per bedroom. Retail, four per thousand square feet. And the restaurant, 15 per thousand. Yeah, and these are based on ITE parking generation manual numbers and kind of just rules of thumb. It very, very, this, this one is very subjective to location, local yes. patterns. Of course, yeah, these are numbers that are demand <laughs> numbers and don't necessarily line up to zoning code requirements. Um, so you can have those fun discussions if a city requires six per thousand square feet at a retail, um, yep. that kind of stuff, or you've run into apartment buildings yeah, some uh, smaller towns, they have some crazy ones where it's they, they do recognize the one per bedroom and then they also put a one per unit in addition to it. So if you have a two bedroom apartment, they need three parking stalls, which um, seems very excessive from our point of view. Yep. And a lot of very urban cities don't go by bedroom, they just go one per unit. So very much dependent on urban, suburban small town, big city. And the, the retail as well, that can be very subjective as if you have a number of different retails, their peak parking may not line up. So um, the four per thousand can be excessive too. Again, so it's, yeah, if it's you have, a guideline here. If there's a movie theater out on the corner that the traffic is Friday and Saturday night versus a grocery store that its traffic is Saturday afternoon. They're more complimentary and overall for the sites, you can get away with less parking. Yep. All right, so with a couple minutes to spare here, we're gonna hit the end. We've hit the end, obviously. Uh, we wanna just say a quick thank you for going with us through this transition to our, our new presentation software. Yep. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, move on quickly to our guide, leave this up here. You can get the guide that has all of this information in there. Everything that we've gone over presents the information. Uh, you can text the number there or email Nancy and we'll get that over to you. But we will allow or we will stay on the line here for questions for as long as there's questions. So we don't want to cut anybody off, but that's the end of the presentation. So if you need to go, we got to run to a meeting or something, by all means, you know, don't let us hold you up. Okay. And let's turn over our next topic next month as we've done. Um, when you go into the highway capacity manual methodology and right turns on reds, there's a default in a lot of the software programs. And we did a bunch of local research on what that percentage should be and sensitivity testing. So that's what we'll be talking about next month. So that's a pretty detailed capacity analysis present based yep. presentation. Um, <clears throat> And also uh, feel free uh, to let us know if you've 
find this Demio platform has a lot of any things we could improve on, please reach back out to us, funnel it through Nancy. Um, yeah, and we do have your transition. and we do have all your comments on the side too. So we did see, even if we didn't mention it, we have seen all your comments. Yep. Okay. So questions. So going back to access spacing, is that between center lines or tangent of the curb? Subjective again, that depends on who's reviewing it. Um, I've referenced both. Usually I go center to center. Yeah, I usually go center to center as well. Um, easier to, well, they're both easy to measure, but yeah. it's subjective. And if you're dealing with, if you're that close on the edge, I mean, arguably it's not going to matter in terms of operations if you're at 650 or 670 i mean the difference between those two is minimal to a driver yeah. yep and we assume you'll have good capacity analysis queuing numbers micro simulations that'll help you if you need to get a variance uh staying with access spacing is the suggested spacing based on speed limits and yes that is correct and that's also recognized in the uh functional classification of the road. Typically, as you move into collectors and arterials, you will have higher speed limits. And so that spacing between them recognizes that as well. Yeah, the hair in the back of our neck would definitely go up if we saw a bunch of driveways next to a Walmart, but that local road was posted at 55 miles an hour. Um, we wouldn't expect it to be, <laughs> but if it was, that would definitely influence the numbers. Again, these are rule of thumb kind of for normal conditions. So for the local roads, we had the 150 foot distance. And the question is, where did that come from? Yeah, and that's a um, bunch of different resources. And I, off the top of my head, can't cite back a specific one. We've looked at TRB has an access spacing guideline manual. Mm -hmm. um, there's different textbooks, there's different city guide guidance out there. So I don't have a specific reference for you. I guess that's more of our, what we use internally. And, and that also needs to be context sensitive. Uh, obviously if you're in a residential development, you may have driveways every 40 or 50 feet or less. Um, and that's not where you would try to put in access basing that local road in that case is intended for all those homes to get to. So um, it's for the, I guess I would phrase it that local road that's between the pure residential and the collector. So if you have some development on it, you wanna make sure that people can get to either that industry or that retail development, uh, nice space in between those intersections. Yeah, and maybe this comes down to a philosophical point of view, but we are not stringent, follow the numbers perfectly, that we will look at variant situations from these types of numbers be based on our analysis and our engineering judgment. We'll go through yeah. capacity analysis, we'll go through queuing, on-site observations, look at long-term future, um, all of it that yeah. sometimes we may back up 145 foot <laughs> local driveway um, if the conditions are right. So. Yeah, that's that's a great point. They are guidelines and we view them as such in the absence of information. That's what we'll fall back on. But then if we look at specific cases, we will try to use more specific details to nail that down. Okay, how is capacity of a trail measured? Um, there, I have never done that, and That's a good question. I don't know. We've only dabbled with the capacity analyses related to pedestrians um, in the highway capacity manual, and I don't know of any software that fully implements that. So that, uh, if you find that out, please let us know. We'd love to pass that information on to everyone. Yeah, I think the only thing I've ever seen is someone trying to take the space around a person. Yep. You know, so get some square footage there, put in a walking Where, speed, and then yeah, you can come up with something that way. PTV has a software program called VizWalk, I believe that is a simulation program yes. that is used around arenas and light rail stations and such for doing full-on pedestrian analysis um, simulations. 
but I don't know if capacity numbers for a trail uh, in the same way we have level of service grades right. for intersections. Not, not something I have off the top of my head for no. sure. Okay. And why don't we flip back? We've had that slide on for a minute. So go back to the guide if you want that. Okay. A few more questions and then we'll wrap it up here. Uh, could you please put the trip gen slide up for a second when no. you're done with questions? <laughs> yes, we certainly can do that. Give me a second as we flip back here. Okay. Okay, and that looks like the last question. So last call if there are any others, otherwise we'll get back to this for Tyler. Oh, and uh, <laughs> had to be the first one too. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us and I look forward to seeing you over the next couple of months as we continue to do the Traffic Corner Tuesdays. Yeah, thanks everyone, appreciate it.